Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to this afternoon's event with T.M. Lerman discussing her latest book, How God Becomes Real, Kindling the Presence of Invisible Others, in conversation with Jack Miles. Today's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's Friday Forum series, which takes place on Friday afternoons during the academic year as a way to highlight scholarly books in a wide range of fields. Though we remain digital for the time being, we have a full schedule of virtual events in the coming weeks as part of this afternoon's series and others, so please check out our upcoming schedule. I will shortly be posting a link in the chat to harvard.com where you can view all our upcoming events. For today's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A button wherever it may live on your Zoom display where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section of this presentation, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copy of How God Becomes Real. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to the series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation button. We greatly appreciate any and all support you are able to extend to us at this time. And lastly, as you may know, if you've participated in large virtual gatherings lately, technical issues might come up. We do apologize in advance for that. If any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. T.M. Lerman is the Watkins University professor at Stanford University, where she teaches anthropology and psychology. Approaching her scholarship from a variety of anthropological vantage points, her work, brilliantly self-described as an anthropology of the mind, observes the conditions that make the world real to people. Her previous books include When God Talks Back, Understanding the American Evangelical Relationship with God, and Mind and Spirit, A Comparative Theory. Jack Miles is Distinguished Professor Emeritus of English and Religious Studies at the University of California at Irvine and Senior Fellow for Religious Affairs with the Pacific Council on International Policy. His book, God, a Biography, won a Pulitzer Prize in 1996. His other books in this trilogy and beyond include Christ, A Crisis in the Life of God, God in the Quran, and most recently, Religion as We Know It, An Origin Story. Today, these two brilliant authors join us for a discussion of Tanya Lerman's latest book, How God Becomes Real, a stirring and comprehensive exploration of the enduring power of faith that Mark Knoll calls beautifully accessible, intellectually humble, and genuinely objective. Through generous glimpses into a number of spiritual communities, ranging from evangelical Christians to Santeria initi initiates to magicians, Lerman touches upon the breadth of religious practice that makes religion not just a complex engagement with tradition and scripture, but an engrossing and ultimately transformative experience that renders the invisible tangible and the theoretical profoundly sensational. I will leave with yet another brilliant observation from Mark Knoll, who says that Lerman, quote, has a rare gift and this book is a rare achievement. We are so pleased to be able to present this gift to you all today. Without further ado, I will now turn things over to Tanya and Jack. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody, or good day. It's nice to be back at Harvard, even by Zoom, for what I think will be really a very uh, interesting conversation. Good morning. Well, good, we, I can say good morning to, to Tanya because we are coming to you both from the West Coast. So I live in Santa Ana, California, Orange County, I actually live on a small orchard. And uh, there is a road that runs along the edge of the orchard and a path along the edge of the road. And from my bedroom in the morning, for months, my wife and I uh, could hear a conversation taking place among what I took to be two women walking by along that path, very animated. But one of them seemed to be doing all the talking. Then one day I was up, up quite early and uh, went out to pick up the morning paper and I heard that voice and the lady came around the bend and she was all by herself. Uh, was she just talking to herself? That's what I initially thought. Oh, this has been a mad woman all these, all these weeks. Well, it, she wasn't talking to herself. She had uh, something in her ear, you know, and was, was talking to her mother or to her best friend as she, as she uh, hiked along very uh, energetically. But if we think that someone is talking to somebody who isn't there, we think they're nuts. 
And uh, that's the opinion that uh, has a certain plausibility when it comes uh, to religion, isn't it? Uh, believers uh, are a bit crazy. You know, they, they talk to somebody who isn't there. You can stand in the room while they are talking to him and notice that that person isn't there. Well, the, the brilliance of Tanya's book is that you might say she finds ways to talk about different ways of not being there. So for example, on, pa on page nine, she gives this example. Jennifer believes that Margaret Thatcher is alive. Sam believes that Jesus Christ is alive. Well, Jennifer has simply made a mistake and Sam may also be making a mistake, but it's certainly not the same kind of mistake because Jennifer's relationship to Margaret Thatcher and Sam's relationship to Jesus Christ are just not uh, in the same category. Well, how is it then that Sam uh, believes? He doesn't, he doesn't do it, uh, Tanya will argue, in the same way that he believes that uh, there is a the way I might believe that there is a laptop before me as I'm speaking. And I'm going to quote again from her page 12. This is my puzzle. People may talk as if the gods are straightforwardly real, but they don't act that way. Not in the Bible Belt, not in medieval England, not in Fiji, and not among the newer people of Africa. People behave as if making invisible others real enough to impact one's life in a positive way takes effort as if one has to learn to think in a certain way and in consequence to believe as if invisible others are not real in the way that ordinary objects are real. So they're different kinds of reality. The reality isn't a simple yes or no binary system. There are variations uh, in reality. And what the simple rejection of religion or, uh, or belief says is how can people possibly believe this? Well, Tanya's book does what so many of the strongest books do. They take some question that's been asked many times, lying in plain view. How do they believe this? And says, okay, let's, let's actually take a close look. How do they do it? So how do they do it, Tanya? Well, thank you very much. Um, that's an excellent introduction. So yeah, so this is a book that really is my, you know, I've spent a lot of time with different faiths, most recently with evangelical Christians, the, particularly the experiential charismatic group, but also with all these, you know, Santeria, pagan, pagan witches, or Awastrians in India, all these different faiths. And so this is my kind of overview about what I think. And I decided to focus on practice rather than on belief, not the why question, um, because first of all, I don't think I have any job. It's not my job. I'd certainly be, be an act of hubris to try to decide whether God exists. But also when you focus on the why question, it just invites you into this, as you point out, this invitation to think that other people are kind of, you know, why do they believe that? So if you focus on the how, it invites you to ask, you know, whether God becomes more real for people because of what they do, um, how what they do changes them, and whether that change making, it contributes to the kind of resilience uh, of faith. And so the book is runs through specific things that I've seen in these different faiths. One of them, so as you point out, I do make a case for the fact that the people hold their ideas about God in a different way than they hold their ideas about the everyday world. So people may claim that God can do everything, but they don't ask God to feed the cat. They don't ask God to take their exams. There, there's something kind of special about this, this kind of off to the sideness in some sense of God. And many people of faith, they want that sense of God to be more intimately related to their world. So what do they do? to kindle God's realness, to make God feel more alive and present and vivid and salient. Well, part of the story is the way that they enter a narrative about God. So there's a story that I tell in the book about the way faith, faith accounts, understandings of faith become like a paracosm, like a shared 
shared but private imaginative world full of details, that the details help people to tell the stories more and more vividly to themselves, that the paracosm, this, you know, will lay out who's kind of a member of the world, how you know whether when spirit shows up, how spirit communicates. So, you know, my evangelicals, for example, would talk about uh, having coffee with God. They would say that if I wanted to understand who God was, I should sit down and have a cup of coffee with him. And this is how I might recognize God's presence in my mind, that he would, his thought would come and it would feel more spontaneous than other thoughts. It would feel like something that God had, would say. It would really capture my attention. They would sort of lay out these kind of invitations to look for the presence of God in their world. So there's a story about the paracosm, the kind of a imaginative world. And I'm not claiming that faith is imaginary, but you have to use your mind in order to represent God because God is not visible in the world before you. Sort of the point of faith in some sense is a kind of, as, as I think you talk about it to some extent, the wor representing the world as it should be rather than the world as it is. Anyway, and then there are a series of other things that I, that the book describes about the specific practices that I could see that help to make God more vivid. Let me um, uh, uh, quote another sentence. You, you say, it's not, not a direct quote, but an indirect mm -hmm. quote, uh, that uh, the anthropologist Mary Douglas said, faith is a shift in attention that reframes. Uh, and uh, this act of uh, reframing you say just a page later, uh, is a shift in perspective similar to the shift in and out of imaginative play, except that the play claims are also serious claims about the world. And when I read that, I, it, it intrigued me because um, the fact that this particular kind of play makes serious claims about the world it explains something you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. There's this general notion that, well, uh, Religion uh, is something for children, but you know, not for adults. But actually the research shows that children are not actually that interested in it, you know? It's true. Uh, and the reason is that they said, oh, this is kind of serious. Uh, yeah. This isn't any fun at all. Uh, and yet the, the, the tools that are involved, the creation of this other world is so much like make-believe in the way that children uh, engage in it. It's a place you go, you know, there's a, and there are rules, there are things you mustn't do and things you have to do and so forth. Right. And uh, extremely engaging, of course. Yes. And it, it creates another world Well, religion can, a religious ritual can do that too. Exactly. So one of the things that I've seen is that people who are able to become absorbed in their inner worlds are more likely to report that God or spirit is vivid present, that sometimes they have voice-like events or vision-like experiences, that they sense God's presence. And so, and this is like unbelievably robust. This is something that I've been doing now for a couple of decades, trying to, to uh, understand um, whether it's true that people who are get absorbed are more likely to have these vivid experiences and to understand how different kinds of prayer practices encourage this, this absorption. So it turns out that it's true that at least by the way that we measure the capacity to become absorbed in your inner and outer senses, people who get absorbed are more likely to report that they experience God or spirit vividly in different faiths, in different countries. We've done this work now in Ghana and China and Thailand and Vanuatu. I've done it in India. There's something really striking about the fact that some people are more able than others to get caught up and to feel God's presence. It is also true that prayer practices, a bunch of prayer practices in Christianity and Judaism, among pagans, are practices that are sort of cultivating the capacity to become ca caught up in a vividly imagined world that is to some extent runs alongside this world, sits on top of it, tries to merge with this world. But so, you know, 
the prayer practices that people may know best are the Christian practices. So the practices where you are, you, somebody will pray, and they imagine themselves, they hold in their minds, their mind's eye, the, 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 an experience of talking with God, and they represent a back and forth conversation. These are practices that ask them to use their inner experience to kind of, you know, somebody once said to me, it's like standing, yeah, I, I'm standing in the throne room. I'm trying to feel the heat of God's power on my cheeks. These are training practices and the practices work. Um, so we know that people who are more li likely to get absorbed, more likely to have a vivid experience of God, people who engage in prayer practices or, or meditation practices are more likely also to have a vivid sense of God and God's presence or spirit's presence or spirit's interaction. And that's um, kind of striking. You know, I, I, I read through the criteria for determining whether whether one is high or low on the absorption scale, uh -huh. and I uh, found that I was quite high, but I would have predicted that. very much uh, of what makes one high on that scale is also what would make one very interested in art or mm -hmm. music. Yeah. And I, I remember... Uh, uh, the a famous German sociologist of religion described himself as as uh, religiously unmusical, uh, and there are there. Are, uh, I have a sister who happens uh, uh, to be uh, tone deaf. <laughs> when when she was in school and the choir was uh, the girls' choir was singing, the uh, sopranos were the canaries and the altos were the robins, and then there were the wrens, and those were the little girls who were asked please not to sing because they just threw everybody else off. So there is ability, aptitude, but there's also training. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? You know, practice. Yeah. Uh, so religion is a if religion is a practice, there's there's a certain similarity between between that practice and practicing the piano. You know, it you Absolutely. do do things, you do scales, you do simple things, yeah. and then over time, uh, you're you're lost in the music. You know, in a way you wouldn't have been if you didn't a uh, certain, certain point to the scales. I, I, I had a friend who, who uh, began training to be a jazz pianist yep. and scales of all kinds and all keys, you know, uh, were, were a part of the, the training so that then you could just shift key whenever you wanted uh, effortlessly. Yeah, and no, I think that's really true. And it tends to unsettle people because it suggests that you know, experiencing knowing God is like becoming good at tennis. It's like becoming good at music. It's just something you learn how to do, but it kind of is. I mean, that's not to claim that people who are what we might call spiritually unmusical do not, are not people of faith, but they are not likely to be the people who are, you know, the, on stage. People love to pray to God and feel God's presence or feel the Holy Spirit come through them or feel the goddess and lead, you know, be the priestess of the coven. There is, there's something about the capacity to enter into this quasi-sensory world, to become captured with it, to let it carry you away. It takes practice, but when somebody does it, they, you know, there, there is this analog in the spiritual domain that that spirit becomes more vividly present. It's harder to do in America, actually. It's because, you know, we tend to think of, you know, so this act of being caught up in your imagination uses, uses the mind. And we tend to think that our minds are like citadels that are there kind of really, really important. Charles Taylor talked about this. Our minds are really, really important, but they're not real at the same time. They're the source of our identity, but thought somehow is immaterial. It's apart from the world. It's un un unconnected to the world. Mm -hmm. And Americans tend not to trust the vividness of these experiences between the mental and the and the kind of the, the the sensory, and in fact, one of the things we see is that that Americans 
have somewhat less, even religiously committed Americans on average, have somewhat less vivid experiences of God than folks. You, know, uh, you, also, you also say when I, uh, I'm quoting you, when I argue that people must work hard to keep their gods real, anthropologists often respond, yes, what you say is true for modern Christians in the secular United States, but it is not true of people in traditional societies that have never been secular. Believing in is something Christians and Westerners worry about, but not other people. But you do argue that even, even in those uh, very traditional societies, uh, where the, the mind uh, is physical, perhaps, in a way that it isn't for us, and sensory experience plays a larger role, even they have to do some of the, some of the same sorts of, of uh, fake it till you make it uh, exercises that... Uh... Absolutely. So the work of my, my friends, Paul Harris here at Harvard or Rita Astuti at the London School of Economics, one of the things they've been able to show is that um, in Madagascar, for example, um, people don't really, they behave as if when they're thinking about religion, the ancestors are real, but when they're not thinking about the religion, the ancestors aren't really relevant. You, if you ask them, they'll tell you that the ancestors are real. But you can, you know, they, actually David Graeber's work, a number of anthropologists have, have shown that, you know, there is this phenomenon of salience um, is just as powerful for people in a small face-to-face -face society as it is in our modern secular world. And that, um, and I think when you look in the, the ethnographies, um, the old ethnographies, anthropologists will sometimes say things that, that suggest that believing in is a Christian or Western or secular thing, um, secular society thing. But in fact, you can see that people are doing quite a bit of work to create a paracosm to enable people to enter it and find God, their spirit salient, and sometimes rather than others. I mean, otherwise, you know, these... I mean, if God is always salient, why do you need an all-night drumming ceremony to call him forth? Exactly. This is this is what I was referring to at the beginning, yeah. that uh, that your work uh, answers that naive question: How do people do this? Well, actually, they have a whole range of methods. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a whole set of practices. They work at it. Uh, but the remarkable thing is that by working at it, they do. Um, bring about something that's quite uh, real and has measurable effects uh, in their life. Uh, let, me, let me try another quote. May I? Okay. Uh, this, this is from near the very end of the book where you, you and I, I'd like to hear you say a little something about that, about uh, the experience of prayer and then uh, uh, having your prayer somehow answered. In any case, you have what you call an attentional learning theory of religion. By that, I mean that the sense of realness rests in part on learning, that this learning involves practices of attention, and that the practices changed what people experience. The way we learn to pay attention not only changes what we notice, but how we experience what we notice. It is not just that people pay attention differently. Instead, what I see is that their attentional patterns can alter something as basic as their perceptual experience. Kindling is a more specific account of how attentional learning unfolds for people. I love the, your use of the word kindling. Oh, thank you. Faith is much associated with, with heat, you know, fervent belief, yeah. on fire with faith, that sort of thing. But it says you're, you're talking about, well, before the fire gets going there, you know, there's the little spark, and there's the little twigs and the things that kind of help it get going. That's, that's where you are in the how and not the why. So, yes, thank you. Um, it, one of the things that most startled me when I began to study religion and I come to kind of more and more deeply think about this over time is, is that God becomes autonomous for people and that's so different when you think about religion as a, as a, you know, as a yes, no, as I have a proposition about the way the world works. But people come to feel 
um, as if there is this external other who is interacting. And I can see that people learn to do this over time. I think that's, by the way, quite independent of whether God in some sense actually exists. What I saw is that people over time would come to have a sense that what I'll call spirit is reliably external to them and responding to them often in their minds, that they will feel a thought and it doesn't feel like their thought. They will feel a communication. It doesn't feel like they're making it up. And this, it's, it's this kind of way of attention, paying attention to your experience such that you look for certain kinds of events that you identify as being not yours. And over time, they come to feel more not yours in a reliable way um, so that people get a sense of, per, of a person who's not visible, who is sometimes more present than others and interactive. And that I just is quite striking. It's a, it's a, it's a profound you know, I, phenomenon. I, I'm struck by something you said just now, putting a certain space between theism um, and this process uh, mm -hmm. that it includes God, but not uh, in the same way that uh, gravity uh, uh, includes the stability of our buildings as they stand in place. It, in the Norton, one, one of my works has been a large editing, a very large anthology called the Norton mm -hmm. Anthology of World Religions. Yeah. In the Norton Anthology of Judaism, there is a substantial section at the end about, uh, I think it's called, the tradition confronts secularism. Right. And uh, in that section, David Beale, the Judaism editor, uh, includes a, a long poem by the Israeli uh, poet Yehuda Amichai that includes the following. I declare with perfect faith that prayer preceded God. Prayer created God, God created human beings. Human beings create prayers that create God that creates human beings. That's lovely. And uh, he also says, here's another, another stanza from that poem. Tombstones crumble, they say, words tumble, words fade away. The tongues that spoke them turn to dust. Languages die as people do. Some languages rise again. Gods change up in heaven. Gods get replaced. Prayers are here to stay. Yeah, I, I, that's lovely. And I think there's something profoundly true about that, that um, in some sense, prayers are terribly important to people. They, that the act of calling God in some sense helps people, helps to call God into presence, um, also changes people. So I think that one of the things that I, you can see when you look at prayer practices is that it kind of looks like cognitive behavioral therapy. People are looking to paying attention to some thoughts rather than other thoughts, being invited to attend to thoughts about gratitude and goodness rather than thoughts about misery and self-condemnation. And I think those are powerful practices that change people's experience. And I think, and to me at any rate, um, I think that prayer changes people profoundly regardless of whether they seek an answer, whether they believe in a God, mm -hmm. there's something about the practice of sitting, examining the self, calling the self into a relationship with a better way of being, you know, um, asking, uh, expressing hope. These are practices that change experience and actually don't depend so much on a God. I mean, it they're better when you have a God who answers back, when you experience that God, because then you are in a relationship with a loving other. It's pretty costly if you're in a relationship with a judgmental, hostile other. And so, and I think that that is something that social science sees. But I think that if you have, you know, the practice changes people by, the, by itself. 
when the practice, when prayer practice is in relationship with a God who is perceived to be loving and interactive, it's um, very powerful. You know, uh, another poet comes to mind as you talk, um, poet and now better known as a memoirist, and that's Mary Carr. Hmm. Mary Carr uh, wrote uh, uh, one of her more recent books is entitled Lit. Lit uh, as in wasted, uh, destroyed, you know, various synonyms that we have for drunk. So she was an alcoholic. Right. And uh, she was also a, a, a confirmed atheist, a somewhat angry uh, atheist, as she describes herself. And so she detested the notion of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and the higher power uh, palaver uh, that they engage in, that was certainly uh, not for her. Um, but she just went, was going from bad to worse and a friend of hers, uh, a Catholic, I think, um, finally said, you don't have to believe it, just do it, kneel <laughs> down, kneel down. And she knelt down and she said some words that he gave her to say. And, and she confesses that against her will almost, she could feel something starting to happen. So this is such a, to me, it was a very vivid illustration of a connection between the body and the mind. So yeah. that the act of kneeling down did something uh, to her. And well, she's, she's sober now, so. Right. No, it is. And it isn't, you know, is, is it the power of God? Well, you know, we don't have to engage it through that, through that narrowest of all gates, you know. Yeah. I mean, so that's one of the things I see in these practices that um, some of these practices help in creating an invisible person who interacts. And this is something that you can describe as an anthropological or psychological process. Um, some of these practices are transformative independently. And I think, you know, whatever one thinks of an external being. And, and I think that prayer is, is, is among those, um, just that this kind of act of kneeling down, as it were, but um, changing your relationship to your own patterns of thinking, your own sense of goal and ambition, your own sense of your own past as, as you evaluate the past of the day and imagine the, the goal of the future, you are changing your relationship with your own memories. And that's powerful. There's one, there's one point I'd like to ask you to address, Tony, before we move to the Q&A. You use the term paracosm. That's, of course, the creation of this other world. But you also use the term parasocial. Yes. Well, you, just now you've been talking about uh, how this act of prayer changes your relationship with this invisible or imagined person and also with your past and so forth. But what about your relationship to other people? Is that also uh, something that this experience can bring about? A parasociety or something like that? So the term parasocial was uh, coined to describe the fact that people have sort of one way relationships. Um, that they have, you know, when, when you watch like Downton, Downton Abbey, uh, people often have, you know, some people have really strong relationships with La Lady Mary. Um, they might have, you know, ideas and they might, you know, Harry Potter, people have lots of view. Sometimes people, you know, develop all kinds of relationships and um with the characters of, 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 a, of a novel. They know that these are novels. They know that these are, this is television. Nevertheless, they come to care about these characters. I mean, when J.K. Rowling talked about whether she, in some interview before the last book came out, she said that she was, she made some playful comment about thinking of killing Harry. And like, place where, you know, the world went into was little spasm. People were very anxious. They wrote to her and there was all this concern. What, they, what, what was she gonna do? Um, and it's like a fictional character. So that's where the term parasocial came from. And that's one way of thinking about the way people structure a relationship with spirit. I think that what I see is that these practices 
help people experience the spirit as talking back, as interacting, as being present. And that goes beyond the parasocial relationship. I do think there's evidence that when this, you know, there, I mean, there is evidence, there's social science evidence that when people experience this invisible being as, um, as loving, uh, when they have a vivid experience of the social being and they experience the social being as loving, then they actually report fewer mental health um, problems. I mean, you know, it's social science. There's this huge volume called on, on the, um, you know, religion and, men, and, and, and well-being. And, uh, it, you know, you can, there are 3,000 articles that talk about the relationship between religious practice of one form or another and one form or another of, of outcome measure of immune system or mental health issues or whatever, and like two thirds of them find some kind of positive relationship. Um, how do you understand that? Well, I think there are a lot of things to, that contribute to this. Um, Harold Koenig is the guy, who the, I think the editor in chief of, that, of, the, of the many iterations of that collect, those collections of essays. But there is something um, resilient about the value that these invisible others bring to individual lives. Doesn't tell us that the, that the, the way people imagine the individual other is good for society, but that there is, does seem to be something kind of robust about many faith practices having a positive impact on the person and their body. Well, I think uh, it's about time uh, for us to entertain a few uh, questions from those out there in Zoom land. And uh, Benjamin is going to help us uh, understand the questions as they arrive. Benjamin? Great, so we have, um, we have quite a few great ones. So I'll start with um, sort of on the topic of the paracosm as we've been talking about. Um, so Joseph in the audience says, how do you, Tanya, respond to the skeptic who says that God is merely our subjective projection? So I, it's a great question. And one of the things people always want to know is what I believe about God. And so, you know, so the bottom line is that I don't think it's my job. I mean, I don't, th I don't think that my skill set can answer that question. And in some sense, that's not where my that's not what I have to offer to the world. What I have to offer to the world is how people learn to experience that God more vividly. And so anything that you know, social science can say about that is perfectly compatible with a view that God is nothing more than the way that humans imagine this invisible being. It, but it's not incompatible with the question of whether an external presence can be made more vividly present in an ordinary human's life. Wonderful, thank you. So we have this um, really interesting observation um, that I'll sort of turn into a question, but we have someone in the audience who says, um, uh, you say, why do we have to invoke the god or goddess if she is always there for me as a wiccan it's how do i get myself to the place where she is um and i'm kind of interested in sort of like discussions you might have had throughout the book about sort of cultures that kind of or like communities that sort of imagine it as like a journey towards something as opposed to bringing something into your place i mean i think that's a great comment and another way to describe what I've been talking about, um, particularly from within a faith community, is the question of how to make the goddess or the god or the spirit truly present in your life. And people often describe that as getting to where she is or he is. So there's this observation that learning is involved, that attention is involved, is often more startling to secular people than it is to people of faith, because people of faith are always struggling with the question of how to get there or how to bring God or the goddess closer 
Does that does that make sense? Is that mm. you, uh, you studied? Uh, I don't know whether it was exactly Wiccans, but you did study uh, in England uh, mm -hmm. women who were in associations like Wicca, didn't you? Yes, and okay. I I remember the the um, you know and I started this work that work. This is my dissertation work with the idea that um, magic was a proposition. You know, you had a had a belief, or you didn't have a belief, and so I was going to find out, you know, how you know people apparently reasonable people believed in what, you know, many secular people would call apparently unreasonable beliefs. And what I found when I spent time with these groups is that it was so much more than a belief. And again, it's not that belief wasn't relevant, but I hung out in these groups, and I started to feel magical power. I started to feel transported. I would go to rituals. And I, I sort of had, I remember the time when the, the kind of the stag God became sort of vividly present to me. Um, I remember um, being, uh, going to a magical ceremony and sort of feeling the white, the, the, the white light um, that, that the, the, the magus was exuding kind of enter into my shoulders. Um, as, as a, and I felt transformed. And so that changed the direction of my career because I, that, it suddenly became clear to me that these practices changed people, that this is, wasn't a way of talking. And then the goal was to have the goddess or the god be vividly present. I remember sitting at a, a, a a, one, I went to one of these event, these events where 50 people would you know, congregate and we'd do a ritual. And somebody said very casually that the goddess had asked her to do a ritual on such and such a British island. Um, and I was like, whoa, this is not a language that I had been familiar with. I mean, I had been raised in a, in a Unitarianism, which didn't have a very person rich understanding of God. And, um, and it was striking to me. I mean, I, real, I realized this was something that was worth trying to understand more about. You know, the uh, perhaps the most uh, popular work of the, the late uh, Jewish rabbi and theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel is mm -hmm. entitled God in Search of Man. And what we've been talking about mostly here is men, human beings in search of God. But if your understanding is that on the other side, there's effort taking place also, yeah. it, it, isn't that all, it isn't that all the effort is expended on the human side and none on the other side. That, of course, is a, a part of the, faith, of the frame. That's a part of the framing mm -hmm. to believe that it's not all just you going there. It's also it coming to you. Yes, and I'm comfortable with that. I mean, the way that I talk about this with um, with audiences of faith is, you know, if God is always speaking, what can an anthropologist say about who is able to hear? What can an anthropologist say about what people do, how people understand their God, their God or their, their spirit, um, and how they listen that helps that reach feel as if it's manifested? I think one of the things I've also seen in these communities, and I became very acutely aware of this in talking to evangelicals, is that people are off, people of faith or the faith communities that I've come to know are often quite sophisticated about the humanness that is between themselves and spirit, that they know that they are reaching through the very human structures of their understanding and that they are trying to recognize what is reaching back and that they need to be both cautious um, about whether they're mistaking the reach and responsive to when they feel that the reach is, is genuine. But they're not, they're not foolish. It's not a kind of a foolish commitment. It's like not, it's not like people, at least the people I've met, talk to it's not like they have they think that god is god or spirit has said something and they just take it straightforwardly as being true they have this the sense that they might be wrong and because of the way in which they inter interpose themselves 
in relationship to God. So I'm going to linger for this next question. I'm going to linger in the British Isles for a bit longer. Um, and I'm going to read the preamble to this question because it's so delightful. But um, Eric in the audience says, I was going to ask about Tolkien and searched your book first. Glad to see him mentioned. I know your concept of paracosm was partly influenced by his world creation, and he would have scored highly on the absorption and delight skills. <laughs> How much is his concept of, quote, sub-creation something that applies to religious practice? Should we be sub-creating more in our thoughts and prayers and sharing that with the real world as Tolkien did? So I'm not sure exactly what Eric, I think, means by, um, by, by sub-creation. But I, I, when I think about um, faith, I, th I myself, um, particularly in my more private moments, I think a lot about the human interaction with the space through which the divine might reach. And I have some sympathy to, for, um, I don't know, I mean, Jack will know this, this language so much better than I, but it, with a processual theology, that the act of creating with others, with like-minded others, is a place through which, in some sense, the nature of God is made for humans. Uh, and, and so I do think that the way that um, there's a kind of responsibility for those who engage in a faith commitment to create responsibly, and to, but to create vividly in order to allow spirit to flourish for them. You know, in Buddhism, there is a, a notion of the world itself as <clears throat> a product of codependent origination that is various forces uh, mm -hmm. came together. It didn't start from, from one single spot. And that similarly, uh, human art uh, will take one form, uh, human creation will take one form if it originates with, in one mind and another if it originates in many. Right. And so, so many of um, the scenes that, that you describe uh, in your book, Tanya, are not uh, of an individual mystic uh, alone in a, in a chamber somewhere or in a garden, but of groups. Yeah. groups gathering and deriving uh, some of this suggestive power, not from their own imaginations, but from the setting, from the, the felt presence of other people, from the collective experience as collective. But that was part of what I was uh, yeah. pushing for and asking about the word parasocial. I understand you can participate in an, imaginate, an imaginative world like the, the Hogwarts, but um, you can also when you enter a, a particular church or synagogue or or a mosque and you are a member of it, you're in you're in a place that is shaped by all, by your relationship with all those other people, not just by the building. And you experience this. Uh, I bet you've had this experience. Surely, going to some of the places you've gone to, initially you feel I don't belong here. I don't fit in here at all. I feel weird. Let me out of here. You know because you. Yeah, you're not in that world, you know. You're not related to those people at all. But then after a while, if you stick around and if you listen to them and and talk to them, you might be brought in. So then you are in that world. Then when you go there, you your uh, whatever they believe reinforces your beliefs and whatever you believe reinforces it. And it, it there's another dynamic. There is. And I, I, I am moved by this sense of co-creation among, among humans um, with openness to the, the possibility of other, of, of spirits participation in a, in a co-creation. One of the things I find really moving about um, evangelicals who, for one reason or another, have left their, uh, their, their faith is that some of them are drawn to liturgical services that, um, you know, they're just, I was talking to, to uh, one man who said that he, 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 couldn't, he could no longer tolerate his faith. 
And so he, he, but he wanted to recite the words of Thomas Cramner, the, the, you know, the epistle, the Anglican liturgy, because these had been words that had been spoken for hundreds of years. And there was something about speaking the words that helped to make something more present in the world for him. And I, I found that moving. On the topic of, I, I was also particularly taken with the idea of co-creation um, and, and also just sort of our discussion of practice. Um, and an attendee named Mary asks this really wonderful question, um, beginning with this maybe a bit far afield, she says, but how does a practice orientation apply to approaches to discussing issues like anti-racism in the future? I think that's a great question. I think that the way that, um, you know, a practice in which you represent um, a community of participation. So, you know, the, the idea of this shared paracosm really depends upon, you know, a, an understanding of, of joint participation. And so I think as people imagine a world that includes others that they may not have deliberately included, um, you do move to change people's understanding of the social whole. I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, if I may, I'd like to tell a little story out of my own life. I was a postdoctoral fellow for one year with the University of Chicago Committee on the Conceptual Foundations of Science. You know, about as cerebral a part of that very, very cerebral community as, as could be found. But after hours, uh, I would go to Teresa's social club on 47th Street, which was a black bar that was favored by some of the Chicago blues musicians after they, after they did their gigs, wherever they were, they'd come back to Teresa's. And the kind of main, main man uh, at Teresa's was a blues singer named Junior Wells. And uh, so this was really a black group, of course, and uh, a couple of white people uh, like me were kind of allowed in, but after a while, you just got to know people, you know, you just got to you recognize the differences among individual regulars and so forth. And, and then it was Junior Wells' mother's birthday. And so they had a whole bunch of food, you know, free food. So they made sure that, you know, we got food too. So that, you know, that I began to that way to, um, to be drawn into, into the black community in a way I, I never had before in a very segregated uh, city. And uh, later at, at Harvard, I participated in the Big Brothers uh, program, and uh, it was created by a black psychiatrist, but he wanted Harvard freshmen. I wasn't a freshman, but I was involved in it uh, to take on uh, fatherless boys from a particular black uh, housing project. Yeah. Well, I was scared to death going into that neighborhood. I thought I would be bothered, you know. I, I, I was really terrified, but I did it. And after a while, I just got completely used to it, you know, and I was in and out of, of uh, these apartments at this uh, complex. I got to know a bunch of different black families. So in this way, you know, I think uh, my, my cosmos, you might say, my American cosmos really was white. I knew black people were there, but they were not inside my circle, you know. Mm -hmm. And then by these experiences, my circle enlarged and they were there and they've never, never not been there, you know, ever since. Mm -hmm. So that's how it, yeah. so experiences like that, I think, I, maybe I'm uh, ranging too far afield. Maybe that's just irrelevant to her question and your answer, but let's go ahead. No, I, I think it's quite relevant. Uh, some of the church, so I spent some time in a black Catholic church in San Diego, which sort of first introduced me to the, this idea of a broad inclusiveness and it was a uh, it was a black catholic church but there were many white people would come because to um to have a different understanding a broader understanding of uh, of god a god that was not just white um and one of the things i see one of the things that gives me hope for um some in the evangelical community is that some, you know, chunk of that community really is uh, pushing for a uh, or seeks a more diverse sense 
of who participates in the church, how prayer works, who God is for the community. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, the world of sojourn sojourners, many of the vineyards, um, you know, many of, you know, there's been a, many evangelicals do have a, a vision of inclusiveness that's quite different from the one that um, is so present for, to, to, to so many of us. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to end with this um, last question. We've gotten a couple questions about research, um, and I'm going to start with this one. So Fred Apple in the audience says, fantastic discussion. I'd like to hear Tanya discuss how this book relates to her entire oeuvre. Is it a summation? Does it augur a new direction of research and writing for her? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, is it, what a great question. So this book is intended to be a summation. Um, it is true that there's another line of my research, which is about psychosis, the way that things become invisible things become real to, for people in ways that we think are kind of broken. But one of the things that I have done over time is I have, as I, I began as a straightforward anthropologist when I was hanging out with, with witches and magicians in London, I just, spent many, many hours being there, talking with people, trying to understand from the inside. And being an ethnographer, being there, trying to listen empathically has always been the core of my research. But as, I, as I've grown more interested in this question of why some people rather than others, how is it that some practices have this impact for what, what kinds of people. I've started to add more work from psychology to my, um, to the quiver of my arrows as it were, and to try to really systematically um, understand. So, you know, so we've got this paper that we're trying to publish in which we really find that the ab absorption predicts the vivid experience of God across religions, and across societies, you know, it's fine society, and this is you know, a small number of religions, but it's still pretty striking. Um, and that more quantitative work just gives me confidence in my uh, qualitative ethnographic understandings. The next step forward is to ask, you know, well, are these experiences psychotic? And no, I don't think that they are. But I can't just say that. I need to be able to understand. So, I mean, and this may horrify Jack, but I'm actually beginning with observing that when people experience God in the Bible, they experience God in pretty different ways. So Samuel's experience of hearing God is pretty different from John of Patmos's, pretty different from Ezekiel's. Who knows who the humans were that the narrators are describing? But the narrators are describing different ways of experiencing this vivid other. And so the next step forward is to try to think about when do these experiences, you know, are they crazy? When are they not crazy? How can we, we be confident they're not crazy? How are they connected to human impulses towards art, creativity, literature, those kinds of things. Anyway, so it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. So I, I, I am always at my core an anthropologist, but I am adding more um, kind of techniques from psychology to answer the questions that I think are really important to get to the core of this human experience of an interacting with invisible others. Great, well, that is all the time, unfortunately, we have for questions, and I think that is a marvelous place to end. But I just wanna take a moment to thank our wonderful speakers for this truly amazing discussion. Um, and I thank all of you for spending your evening with us and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Please make sure to check out How God Becomes Real at the link that I placed in the chat. Um, thanks again for your time and your support and for spending your afternoon with us. Have a great day, everyone, and stay well. And thank you to Harvard Bookstore. Thank you indeed. Bye. Thank you.
Bye.